Hey everybody, in this video we are going to talk about the second great awakening. Um, I referred to it in the discussion about the first great awakening. This is this is the big, big American revival. Okay, so let's dive into it. Um, I'm going to give you some overview and then we'll talk about some different figures in the movement. All right, so let's go. What is this? Uh, first, like the first great awakening, it describes uh, a general pattern of religious revivalism, not a single, singular or organized event. It began roughly around 1795 and lasted until maybe 1825-ish, okay, maybe a little later. Um, the revival was both larger and reached more people than the First Great Awakening. And the two best known leaders were probably Charles Finney and Francis Asbury. And I will talk about them both actually Asbury in this video, Finney in the next video, um, free will and intentionality are really foundational here. Um, there's also an increased participation of women, of people of color. Um, there's an increased commitment to social reform movements in here. Um, and it was marked by more emotional, uh, forms of Christianity and kind of this, um, immediate conversion all right the idea like accept jesus christ into your heart as your lord and savior you know can accept jesus right now all right that is really kind of bubbling up from this event okay so let's talk a little bit about why the first and second great awakenings are so different First and foremost, the colonies actually won their independence from England, becoming the United States of America. Um, after the revolution, then there's this influx of population through immigration. Um, there's an increased social mobility and greater access to wealth in the U.S. Um, kind of the old established denominations of the colonial period, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, especially the Anglicans, are losing out to newer forms of Christianity, you know, Methodism, Baptism, uh, the the Baptists, all right. Um, and the dominance of Methodist theology in this movement really cannot be overlooked. Okay, now I want to talk about this guy that I have up on the screen here, Francis Asbury. Um, I have him, a picture of him on horseback, all right. Um, he gets very, very little attention in your book. Um, so I want to talk about him here because he is really, really important in um, American religion, okay. Uh, he was born in 1745 in England to a working class family. He converted uh, to Methodism when he was 14 at a revival. Uh, he joined uh, a weekly religious meeting and quickly began uh, kind of a leadership role within that. By the late 1760s he was one of the principal Methodist lay preachers in England um, and then he was sent to America in 1777 and then because the Methodists were still associated with the Anglican Church in America um, he basically spent like the next four years in hiding because of the war um, but after the war ends he really ramps up missionary activity okay so What's kind of interesting is the break between American Methodist and British Methodist um, basically comes down to the fact that Asbury becomes like the de facto leader of the American Methodist Church, and he cannot get Anglican bishops to ordain priests to send out to these Methodist societies. All right, so he begins to ordain ministers for an independent Methodist Church in America. All right, so this break between the English and the American kind of varieties of Methodism is really practical. It's not stemmed in like big theological disagreements. It's just like Asbury needed, he needed pastors, all right? And he wasn't getting them from England, so he kind of becomes the bishop so he can do this, all right? So in December 1784, the Methodist Episcopal Church uh, is founded in Baltimore. If you remember from your chapter on Wesley, uh, he actually was not particularly happy what was happening over in America. Um, but by this time, the Methodist in America, like method, it was heading in its own direction. Okay. And it was leaving its English counterpart behind. All right. So why did the Methodism take off so well in the States? Um, there's a theological reasoning here, uh, kind of Methodist theology really um, appealed to a number of people. Okay, 
but their evangelism was just like so good. All right. Um, Asbury told all of his, you know, writers that they should, this is a quote, go into every kitchen and shop, address all aged and young on the salvation of their souls. Okay. He wanted to spread the gospel and this kept him on the move for the, for the rest of his life. All right. He was one of kind of America's great itinerant writers. Um, before he died, he had traveled nearly 300 hundred thousand miles on horseback thus the picture of him on a horse okay uh, and he expected this level of commitment from his riders all right most Methodist itinerant riders um, went where they were needed okay they may serve in a variety of different churches on the frontier you know maybe they'd have eight churches that they're <laughs> riding between okay um, most of these riders stayed single because this lifestyle was not conducive to having a family they were paid virtually nothing. In fact, some of these early writers, like, didn't, they didn't survive real long. Um, however, uh, they did get results. The statistics are pretty wild. Um, in 1771, there were four Methodist ministers caring for about 300 Methodists in North America. When Asbury died, there was uh, when he died in 1816, there were 2,000 ministers and over 200,000 Methodists, and then several thousand more in Canada. Okay, um, so I want to shift gears slightly, and I want to talk about uh, the foundation founding of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, or the AME as it is often referred to. Okay, so up on the screen, I have a picture of Richard Allen. Okay, he is the founder um, and first bishop uh, of the AME. Okay, Allen was born a slave and was converted by the Methodists at the age of 17 while working um, uh, on a Delaware plantation. Um, immediately after his conversion, he felt the call to preach. All right, he taught himself to read and write. He was able to purchase his freedom. Um, but first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background here. All right, um, during the Second Great Awakening, this is when you get the the true first efforts of some of these denominations to convert enslaved Americans, okay? The Methodists and the Baptists were especially enthusiastic about converting um, and often had to try to convince like slave owners that th they should be allowed to do this. Um, but unfortunately, they often made really hefty concessions um, to slave owners uh, and offered up a Christianity that was um, pretty watered down, maybe not real true to the faith. Um, which the missionary saw as kind of a necessity, a, a necessary evil to actually, you know, be able to reach um, enslaved people. But it, it's also very unfortunate, okay? Um, you know, African Americans heard countless sermons from white preachers about slaves obeying their masters, but you, you can't hide the truth okay the bible teaches freedom all right and enslaved people are able to see the liberation in the faith okay you know the exodus becomes a really dominant theme in slave religion and it's a form of resistance okay um I will, i'll talk more about this later uh when i kind of dive into the intersection of religion and abolitionism um but for now let's just kind of focus on alan but i want to name sort of that 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 past piece okay so before 1865, most black churches were kind of part, in the South, okay, um, were like part of white churches so they could be kind of kept under white control. This was obviously not welcomed, all right? Now, how this relates to Allen. Um, after Allen purchased his freedom, he ended up going to Philadelphia and attending St. George's Church, okay? And this was a church that was kind of controlled by white members. Um, he was allowed to preach, but only to black members of the church. Um, around 1787, uh, his friend Absalom Jones, who's really an interesting guy too, um, was praying at the front of the church and, and had a number of white men forced him out and like go to the white section or the black section of the church, okay? And as a result, Allen and Jones founded the Free African um, Society, which is actually America's first organization established by African Americans for African Americans. Okay, um, in 1794, Absalom Jones becomes a minister at St. Thomas Episcopal Church. Um, this is the nation's first all-black Episcopal congregation. Um, 
but Alan wanted to stay with the Methodist Church, okay? Uh, and there's, you can actually read more about the society and, and there's books about this. I'm giving you the kind of quick overview here. Um, the Free African Society was dedicated by Francis Asbury as the Bethel African Church. Um, Asbury ordained Allen five years later, and by 1803, Bethel Church had over 400 members. All right, in 1816, representatives from 16 different African American churches met and they decided to form their own denomination. Um, Allen became the first bishop of this newly formed African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and today, the AME has about estimated 3 million members. Um, related to this, I want to talk about kind of an interesting woman here, Jarena Lee. Um, she's kind of known as one of the earliest women preachers in the AME. Um, you know, she was a member of this denomination and she really, really felt the call to preach. Um, now, I want to make a distinction between like preaching and being ordained. All right, back, uh, back in the 19th century, you could get a preaching license, but you weren't ordained. This was actually a fairly common occurrence, actually. Um, so the AME actually won't ordain women until 1960, but remember, remember the Methodists have always had this very long history of letting lay people lead and lay people preach. And so she's kind of within that, all right? A lot of the early women preachers um, were either licensed to preach or just called by the spirit and went, even if they may not have had that license, okay? Technically with Lee, she was an extorter, okay? She was not technically a preacher but for all practical purposes, she was a preacher, okay? Um, we have access to Lee's writings. I use some of them in my women's history class, actually. All right, so Lee converts to, to Methodism, all right? And she feels the call to preach. Um, but this is not something that women were doing much at this point, all right? We're starting to see a few women preachers, but not many. Um, and she was married to an AMU pastor, actually, who did not want her to preach. So she respected his wishes while he was alive. However, after her husband died, um, this is about after six years of marriage, she ended up receiving Alan's blessing and went out as a traveling preacher. Actually, this story is really great. Um, she is feeling the call to preach. She's kind of being told no, and she's at Bethel Church, and Alan is, goes up to preach, and she describes it in her autobiography as the spirit left him, and, and he couldn't preach. And she gets up, filled with the spirit goes up and preaches an amazing sermon and then alan goes like yes you you can go and preach like obviously you are meant to do this okay um and so she is largely considered a pioneer um she opened the door to women especially women of color to have even larger roles in religion okay first in preaching and then later you know even though she wasn't ordained later in kind of the fight for women's ordination all right, uh, so really interesting figure there. Now, I want to wrap things up with the Methodists. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to tackle camp meetings, um, but I do want to kind of make a few final notes um, on the Methodist Church in this time. Uh, you can trace a lot of denominations and movements back to Wesley. Um, there are various denominations within the, de the Methodist name. Obviously, I've mentioned a couple here. Um, the biggest of these in the 19th century was the Methodist Episcopal Church, which ends up splitting into ME North and ME South over the issue of slavery. Uh, they ended up joining back in the 20th century. They merged with the United Brethren in 1968 to create the UMC that we all know of today. Um, though, yes, the Holiness and the Pentecostal churches actually also traced their um, way back to Wesley. And I will return to that uh, when I talk about the rise of Pentecostalism in the 20th century with the Sousa Street revival later in the semester. All right, that is where I'm going to leave this video. Um, all right, thanks, everybody. Bye.